Hello and welcome back to week 7 of Project Phobocam in what will be the final instalment in this video log series of my master's project to design a thermal infrared camera for a sample return mission to Mars's moon Phobos. So after the kind of mad rush towards the end of last week to get the desiccator fully operational, here it is, it's finally working and I've got some non trinite samples in there having all of the water in them removed at around 200 degrees Celsius. But this week it's finally time to do the science on them to get our results that we'll use to design this instrument to go on our spacecraft. So what I'm going to be doing this week, firstly, we're going to be removing the samples from the desiccator. The desiccator will be quickly lifted up. We'll be removing them with a pair of tongs and placing them inside a portable travel desiccator. Now, this little box here has a pump such that you can pump the air out of it and create a vacuum inside of it. That's to make sure that when we're transporting it between various experiments, water doesn't seep back into it and defeat the entire objective of desiccating them. So. What we actually want to do is we want to measure the samples in the thermal infrared in what we call the moon box. Now I'll be showing you the moon box later and I'm really excited to show you this. It's basically a chamber that will simulate directly the conditions that we would experience on Phobos, namely a vacuum heating the samples from above at around 300 Kelvin, which if you remember from a previous episode, is what my computational model of Phobos deduced to is its surface temperature, and also heating it from below with the temperature we would expect the subsurface layers to be warming up the samples. That will create a thermal infrared spectra of the clay sample that I'm simulating here in order to show us characteristic spectral features that the spacecraft orbiting Phobos could use to identify what potential landing sites are made of. And I'll be using those spectral features to define the signal to noise ratio that the instrument needs in order to be able to differentiate between different compositions and say, oh look, here's landing site A, this contains say this clay mineral, this is sample site B, this contains say olivine, and select the optimum landing site based on composition. But we also need to make sure that the desiccator has actually done what it says on the tin. So I'll be putting some of the samples into a near infrared spectrometer to investigate that the water has indeed been removed by looking for key spectral bands, say about 1.4 or 1.9 micrometers, because we've already measured some of these samples before going in the desiccator and you see a very characteristic dip in their spectra at certain positions, a chemical footprint of water. And now we're going to measure them after going through the desiccator to check the water is gone. And you'll also remember that last week I put one of these samples, in fact two of the samples actually, a Montmorillonite and non trinite sample into an X-ray diffraction machine in order to look at the underlying atomic structure of the clay samples. I'm also going to be putting in the desiccator samples into the X-ray diffraction machine to see how their atomic structure has changed. Because one thing that we're expecting is that these clay samples kind of have layers of atoms like this with water in between them. And when they go in the desiccator, the water should evaporate and the layers should collapse onto each other. So that's one thing that I'm expecting to see, but I want to actually check. Well, that, that's how we do science. We check to see whether our hypothesis has been proven correct. So this week is very exciting. So let's get started and actually doing some measurements. Okay, so let's take a look at how to do a measurement with the near infrared spectrometer to check that the water in our samples have been correctly removed. Firstly, we want to load some potassium bromide into a sample cup and then measure it in the spectrometer. This is to give us a reference spectrum. So firstly, we start off by cleaning the sample cup that we're going to be putting the potassium bromide in. So we do this using some isopropanol. Just squirt it in and clean it, because we don't want to have any contamination of our samples. Great, and isopropanol evaporates really, really quickly, so that's practically dry already. So now we need to load in the potassium bromide. Got to do this quite quickly because it's relatively reactive with the water in the air. Okay, and pat it down and roughly level it off. Okay, that should now be fine. Now we need to take this potassium bromide and put it into our spectrometer. So let's go take a look at the spectrometer. So here's the spectrometer, and now let's go and put the potassium bromide inside of it, and then we'll do a close up. Here we go. 
So now, when I close off the spectrometer and bring this part down here, it will align the various mirrors and focus on the sample. So notice that a kind of orange light is now focused, a beam on the sample. I need to align this so it's right over the middle of the sample because this is what's going to be obtaining our spectra, our reference spectra that we need. So I can do this just by turning this little part here because we don't want the side of the sample cup, the aluminium, to be caught in there. So let me take a look and see what reading we're getting on the computer now. So here is the potassium bromide reference spectrum. Now let's measure some of the undesiccated nontronite. Once we've leveled the top, we need to take out the potassium bromide from the near-infrared spectrometer and replace it with our nontronite sample. Once again, the tungsten source illuminating our sample has to be aligned such that the side of the sample cup is not in the beam's cross-section, or otherwise, aluminium signatures will appear in our reflectance data. Now, once we have the data, we also need to measure the desiccated samples. And in fact, we can measure the desiccated samples a number of times to see if water features reappear when they're exposed to lab air for long periods of time. So let's take a look at the preliminary results. Here are three near-infrared spectra. The purple curve is the nontronite before desiccation, whilst the orange and black curves are from the desiccated sample with the black curve being taken immediately after leaving the desiccator and the orange curve taken half an hour after being exposed to lab air. Firstly, the general shape resembles a black body curve with absorption features. To make the features clearer, the black body shape and background will be divided out using the potassium bromide reference spectrum later on in the processing. But even before processing, I've highlighted a few key noticeable features. Oh, and by the way, the axis at the bottom is measuring in wave number units of inverse centimetres. If you want to convert into wavelengths in micrometres, you just divide 10,000 by the wave number. Anyhow, the red boxes indicate absorption features due to water. Although the one at 1.4 micrometres is a little hard to make out here, the characteristic feature at 1.9 micrometres seems almost completely absent in the desiccated sample, indicating that the sample has indeed had its water content removed. The broad water feature at 3 micrometres is also interesting, because the fact that it gets deeper over time shows that water is being adsorbed onto the surface of our desiccated samples if they are left exposed to lab air for too long. Finally, one really interesting sharp absorption that I've highlighted at 2.8 micrometers is a metal hydroxyl feature from the nontronite itself. Now, some spacecraft observations from a couple years back highly suggest that there is an absorption feature present on Phobos at this wavelength. Now, this is one of the reasons why nontronite is actually a good candidate for our simulated Phobos regolith. Since the desiccation appears to have been successful, it's time to remove the large sample cup from the desiccator and obtain its thermal infrared emission spectrum in the moon box. Here is a schematic diagram of the moon box, which consists of a sample cup and a black calibration target at the bottom, both of which are heated from below, a lamp simulating solar heating from above, and a liquid nitrogen cooled radiation shield. The entire chamber is pumped out to vacuum conditions of less than 10 to the power of minus 3 millibars. The detailed design and operation of the moonbox are described in a series of papers by Dr Ian Thomas, who built the device here at Oxford a few years ago. Now, let's load the sample stage with the desiccated nontronite. The black object that you can see to its right is the calibration target, which is used to divide out black body emission. Once loaded into the moon box, it's time to cool the radiation shield down to around minus 120 degrees Celsius to ensure that emission from the surroundings is suppressed and only emission from our sample is detected. This is done with liquid nitrogen. Finally, the sample is illuminated by a 75 watt quartz halogen bulb to simulate the sun. This week has been spectacularly successful. After all of the delays and problems earlier on in the project with the designing and construction of the desiccator, this week the results have been flooding in. I have the XRD measurements so I can understand how the crystal structure of our clay samples have changed after going through the desiccator. I have the near-infrared spectra that I showed you, demonstrating that water has been removed during the desiccation process. And I have the thermal infrared emission spectra, 
from the moon box where the clay samples have been subjected to simulated phobus conditions, very similar to the thermal model that I demonstrated earlier on in the project. Now, unfortunately, I can't show you the actual spectra from the moon box just yet because we're going to be publishing them first and so it's all confidential, but I'm extremely pleased with the results. So what I'm going to be doing next week, because I've decided to extend this by one week, for the final week, the eighth week of this project, is I'm going to be carrying out the analysis on all the results and data that I've got in order to complete the design of the Phobos camera. So I'm going to be picking out and choosing where the spectral bands are going to need to be on the film infrared camera. I'm going to be examining the signal to noise ratio of the instrument. And I'm going to be comparing the thermal infrared spectra from our clay sample of simulated Phobos regolith with Apollo moon samples from Apollo 16 and some carbonaceous chondrite meteorite samples. So I'm very excited. This is it. The culmination of my project next week. Here we're going to see what we need in order to be able to do a sample return mission to Phobos. Thanks for watching. With the data from our experiments now in, next time I'll be discussing the results, the architecture and scientific purpose of a Phobos sample return mission, and finally my design of the thermal infrared camera that will prove vital for landing site selection on Phobos.